Hi, and thank you for watching. In this video, I would like to show you how the Bible is pointing out a legal case building against our enemy, Satan, and what that could mean for those who were created in God's image, and also for our enemy, Satan. Please watch this video to the end, even if you feel that you do not agree with everything that is shared, because the most amazing discovery from God's Word and the possible implications will be revealed at the end of this video. This is a message of hope to those who may discover that they have stepped into the enemy's trap. But it is also a message of victory over our enemy, even for those who were deceived by him. As always, please compare what I share with you with the Word of God and see if what I say is true or not, just as the Bereans did. Also, if you do not understand how the harvest and temple models apply to believers in Christ, then this information will probably be difficult to make sense of or to understand. If you have watched my channel for a while, you will know that I often point to the harvest and temple models that are shared in much detail in God's Word, and that are given as patterns to help us understand believers' position in Christ. I have provided a link to a five-part series on this that I would highly recommend you watch if you have not seen it yet. One passage in which both the harvest and temple models are mentioned, in reference to believers, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. We also know that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus' resurrection from the dead represents the first fruits of a harvest, and that those that belong to him, which concerns the second portion of the harvest model, will be resurrected at the time when he reaps the earth. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Before we can fully understand what Paul is saying here, we need to have a thorough understanding of how a harvest is conducted, how many parts it consists of, and the order associated with a crop that is gathered in. There are also legal aspects involved with the harvest process that we need to take note of, and this is specifically what I would like to focus on today. In Leviticus 23, the following instructions regarding the harvest process are provided. Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall weigh the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall weigh it. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. From these passages we understand that there are three parts to a harvest, namely the first fruits, the owner's portion, and the gleanings or the corners that are given to the poor and the stranger at the time when the owner gathers in his portion. So how would a biblical harvest be conducted? The owner of the harvest would sow his field and would wait for the crop to grow until the first ripe fruits become available. Then he would remove a sheaf of the first ripe fruits from the harvest and would then take it to the temple so that the priest could present it as a wave offering before the Lord on the morning after the Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled this instruction perfectly at the time of his resurrection and showed us how the pattern of the harvest applies to the resurrection of the dead. What remains in the field, after the first fruits have been removed, are the owner's portion and the gleanings, which would be indistinguishable from each other until the owner begins the reaping process. Once again, if you would like to consider the finer details, please watch the five-part series linked in the description below. After the first fruits were presented, the owner then waits for the entire crop to ripen, 
after which he will then harvest a portion that belongs to him, while leaving the corners of the field to the poor and the stranger. When the owner begins his harvest, those who are considered the poor and the stranger can then enter the field, given the owner's delineation of the corners, which then become the legal property of the poor and the stranger. The Bible shows us that the third portion of the harvest that is given to the poor and the stranger is holy to God because we read the following in Romans 11. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. This presents an apparent problem because God's word tells us that the entire harvest is sanctified by the first fruits and is therefore holy to God. So what becomes of the gleanings that are handed over to the poor and the stranger? What happens to this portion in light of the fact that it is holy to God, but have now become the property of a new owner? Could God buy this portion back or redeem it a second time, so that it does not become the permanent property of the poor and the stranger? The word of God just happens to answer this question very specifically, and the answer to this question is found in Leviticus 27. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Notice that the corners of the harvest are not sold to the poor or the stranger. They are given away as a free gift. This passage also states that it is not redeemable, because it has already been made holy. So the understanding is then that if something that is already holy to God is given to a new owner, a second redemption is not possible. The final sentence in this passage is very interesting because it singles out people who are holy to God, and that God's instruction regarding holy people who become the legal property of a new owner requires that they be put to death to remain holy to God. Is this not exactly what is expected from the tribulation saints, or believers who belong to the gleanings of God's faith harvest? And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So for those believers who are part of the gleanings of God's faith harvest, what happens to those who are not put to death? Well, they become the permanent and legal property of the poor and the stranger, and they will be marked as such. That is why we can know that there will be no believer who is considered holy to God that will make it through the tribulation alive. They will all be put to death or will become the permanent property of their new owner. This rule will however not apply to Israel, because they have a harvest of their own, and that harvest's first fruits are only gathered in at the time of Christ's return to the earth to establish his kingdom, and by this time the fullness of the Gentiles would have been gathered in and would be complete. And it also marks the end of the faith harvest. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. You will see that the 144,000 are referred to as the first fruits, and this implies that we are dealing with a new harvest. We also see that the 144,000 consist of people coming exclusively from the tribes of Israel, and that they include no Gentiles whatsoever. 
This is a specific property that differentiates this harvest from the one that would complete at basically the same time when this harvest's first fruits will be gathered in. Many believe that there will be no believers who will remain behind after the rapture, and that it will only be Israel and the lost who will be on the earth when the tribulation starts. But such an understanding goes directly against multiple patterns and models that our Heavenly Father showed us in His Word, not only in the harvest model, but also the temple model. Both follow the same sequence of events and both require the third portion to be given away. And if one believes that our Heavenly Father will not leave the corners of His harvest behind for the poor and the stranger, then we are calling Him a thief and a lawbreaker. And that is certainly not who He is. There will be many believers who will say, Lord, Lord, after the rapture occurs, who received salvation but who rejected the truth of God's word by slicing and dicing it in such a way that it would suit their doctrines, instead of aligning their understanding with the truth of the entirety of God's word. I think our Heavenly Father instituted the gleanings as part of a harvest to establish a legal case against our enemy, in which no accusation could be made against our Heavenly Father of not being generous and giving to the poor and the stranger as instructed. So what is this legal case against the enemy? Well, first we have to answer the following question. What happens when the poor and the stranger enter the field and begin to glean the harvest? During the gleaning process, the poor and the stranger gather in what is given to them by the owner of the field. Before the owner gathers in his harvest, the corners of the harvest are not yet identified, and this prevents the poor and the stranger from starting the gleaning process, until the owner marks out the corners when he reaps what belongs to him. At this point, the corners become the legal property of the poor and the stranger. Now how is this effected in the lives of believers who remain behind, or those who come to faith after the rapture? Firstly, we know that the beast or the Antichrist under Satan's control represent the poor and the stranger during the tribulation, and that a transfer of authority is shown to us between the time when Jesus established his church on the earth and the time when the Antichrist begins his rule on the earth. That transfer of power is seen when we consider the following two passages. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. The situation in Matthew 16 shows the church in a position of authority, with hell itself not being able to resist it. But in Revelation 13, when the Antichrist is on the scene, that authority no longer belongs to the saints. At this point, the Antichrist is given power to overcome what would be considered the Church of God on the earth. And this fits in perfectly with the transfer of ownership over the gleanings of the harvest that remains in the field, as shown to us in the harvest model. A transfer of authority from the original owner of the harvest to the poor and the stranger occurs when the owner gathers in that which belongs to him. Now what would happen if the poor and the stranger entered the field and began the gleaning process before the owner harvested that which belongs to him. Such an act would be seen as theft, and the owner could make a legal case against those who would illegally be taking from his field before he gathered in what belongs to him. Now the million dollar question is this, is there evidence from the word of God that our enemy would make himself guilty of this offense, and enter God's harvest before the gleanings were assigned to him, and could it be possible that a case of theft and trespassing could be brought against our enemy Satan. If such a case can be proven, it would also be important to consider the penalties and implications that will be brought against our enemy. The Bible tells us that men do not despise a thief when he steals to satisfy his hunger. We further know that Satan would not steal from God's harvest because he is hungry, but that Satan is a murderer and a liar, and the only reason he would try to steal from God would be out of hatred for God and those that are made in God's image. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. The thief cometh not but for to steal, 
and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The next question then is this, how would our enemy go about stealing from God's harvest if he entered the field before the appointed time? I believe he will simply begin the process that is assigned to him during the time of the gleanings before the owner reaped his harvest. We know that during the tribulation our enemy will mark those who do not follow God's instruction as given in Leviticus 27 with a mark that will make them Satan's eternal property and those who do will receive God's eternal torment with Satan and the fallen angels in the lake of fire, if they accepted his mark. This will come down to a simple but very difficult choice that everyone alive on the earth will face during the tribulation. That decision will involve deciding between laying down their lives for the testimony of Jesus and his word, or alternatively accepting Satan's mark in their bodies. If Satan becomes a thief who enters God's harvest before Jesus collected the owner's portion, then Satan will begin to mark people with his mark before he is allowed to do so, and for this a legal case could be made against him. The legality of this case would be based on the fact that he violated the ordinances of God's law that relate to the harvest process. If Satan placed his mark on people before Jesus reaped his harvest, then he is standing in a field where he is considered to be trespassing, and stealing that which does not belong to him yet. In Revelation chapters 13 and 20, our enemy's gleaning process is described to us, and we therefore know the method with which he will glean. And we also see Leviticus 27 applying to those who want to remain holy to God after becoming the property of a new owner. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Why will people who accept the mark of the beast in their body suffer eternal torment? We find the answer when we combine Jesus' reference to the days of Noah as a time in history that we need to study when we want to know what will happen at his second coming, with what is said in Genesis 6 and Daniel chapter 2. This mark that our enemy will put on people will transfer ownership of that person who receives the mark from God to Satan, because it will remove God's image from the bodies of those people who accept it at a cellular level. Redemption from sin is only offered to those who are made in the image of God, and not to Satan, the fallen angels, or the hybrids that are attributed to the fallen angels in both Genesis and Daniel. The first time this corruption of flesh occurred was during the days leading up to Noah's flood. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Jesus said that if we wanted to know what will happen at his coming, we need an understanding of what happened during the days of Noah. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. So based on what has been written to us in these passages, we know that we will see a similar pattern that would once again involve the corruption of all flesh and the removal of God's image from people's bodies before the next flood comes over the earth. The word of God shows us that the next flood will be one of fire, 
and represents God's wrath being poured out over the wicked and our enemy, as described to us in great detail in the book of Revelation. In Daniel chapter 2, we are given a little more information about this corruption of flesh that will occur on the earth before Jesus returns, and confirming for us that what happened during the days of Noah will once again happen during the return of our king. This corruption is clearly shown to us in the composition of the feet of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, and is explained by Daniel to involve the mixing or splicing of two seed lines. One would be human and the other belonging to the fallen angels that are referred to as the sons of God in Genesis. And given that Jesus said that we should look at what happened during the days of Noah, we can know that those who will mingle their seed with that of men will be the fallen angels. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. When we consider the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream and study it in a little more detail, we see that it consisted only of metal starting with the head of gold that represented the Babylonian empire under Nebuchadnezzar's rulership. And then it goes down to the legs of iron representing the Roman Empire. All four kingdoms consisted of metals only. Looking at the feet, however, there is a mixture that occurs and Daniel explains to us in verse 43 that this mixture refers to the mingling or splicing or genetic modification of people's biology. When we look at the feet, we are given additional insight into the timeline involved with how the splicing and modification will occur. And this is where it would seem that we find evidence of our enemy's crime, foretold almost 2,500 years ago. Why do I say this? When it comes to the Ten Toes, we know that this final kingdom under the rulership of Ten Kings, who will be hybrids or Nephilim, only comes into play once the restrainer is removed, since the Antichrist will be one of these Ten Kings and can only be revealed after the restrainer is removed. Also, in reference to the harvest, the Antichrist, who represents the poor and the stranger on the earth during the tribulation, is only allowed to enter God's harvest once he gathered in that which belongs to him. We haven't seen such a gathering yet. And as such, the Antichrist is still restrained. We further read about these ten kings in Daniel and Revelation, where they are represented as horns, referring to the authority that is given to them, and that they will rule with the Antichrist, and that the Antichrist will be one of them. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we are told that the Antichrist will only be revealed once that which is holding him back is removed. But we are specifically told that the mystery of iniquity would be at work before he appears on the scene. And when we look at how this would be understood from the perspective of the harvest model, it would once again point to the time of the owner's harvest. The Antichrist who is the poor and the stranger and who is to receive the gleanings of the harvest from the owner of the field, who is God, is prevented by the word of God from entering the field until the owner gathers that which belongs to him. From what we read, however, it would seem that the work that the Antichrist will do when he is on the earth, which is to glean the remainder of the field, would begin while he is still restrained, and pointing us once again to the mixture of clay with iron even before the time of the ten toes comes about. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Both of these passages describe the same event. Something needs to be removed before the Antichrist can be revealed. And from a harvest perspective, that event represents the owner gathering in his harvest. The authority over the harvest only transfers from the original owner or God to the poor and the stranger or the Antichrist once the owner gathers in his portion. 
That means that the rapture that is so clearly described to us by Daniel, Jesus, Paul, Jeremiah, Isaiah and others will be required before the ten kings can step forward from which the Antichrist will then emerge. That point in time is marked on the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream where the transition from the feet of the statue to the toes occurs. If our enemy adhered to the instructions in God's law, only the toes would have been of a mixed substance. But what does God's word show us? We read the following. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Knowing what the mixture of clay and iron means, as clearly explained to us by Daniel, and that it points to our enemy's gleaning process during the tribulation, in which he will try to place his mark on those that are given to him, this passage shows us that our enemy will enter God's harvest before his appointed time, and that he will steal from God's harvest before Jesus collected those that belong to him. I'm of the opinion that we are seeing that process happening in the world around us right now. We Satan has begun marking those that he is trying to steal from God's harvest by modifying their genetics and removing God's image from their DNA. It also confirms for us, if there were any doubts, that what is happening in the world right now with people being pressured into accepting an unknown substance into their bodies that modifies their genetics, that we are indeed seeing the mark of our enemy being placed on those who will accept it before his time arrives. How can I say this? Well, the same mixture between clay and iron that will occur during the time of the toes on Nebuchadnezzar's statue is happening as part of the feet. And what is happening in the world right now will continue once the toes that represents the tribulation comes into play. Now, there are certainly implications awaiting our enemy for doing this, if this understanding is correct. And I would like to show you some other hints in God's word pointing to this possibly being our Heavenly Father's intention. Let us consider some of these possibilities. When Jesus spoke to his disciples about watching for the Lord's return, he made the following interesting comment with regards to the thief breaking into his house. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants, whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. We know that Jesus refers to himself as the good man in his word, but we are also told that he declares the end from the beginning. So there is no way in which he would not know when the thief would come to break into his house, and the evidence for it is already seen in the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. But the fact that it is mentioned here once again ties in with what we read in Daniel chapter 2, where the evidence of our enemy's theft is documented before it happened. Everything that is written in God's word is there to give us a better understanding and to allow us to get to know our Heavenly Father and His Son and His Holy Spirit more intimately. So why would the good man, who knows when the enemy would strike, allow him to break into his house? I believe Jesus made this hint about the thief breaking into his house because our Heavenly Father has a very specific plan that our enemy may not be aware of. The first hint that we find of this plan is given to us in Colossians chapter 1 verse 20 where the following is written, For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. If there are people who were created in God's image and who are part of all created things, but who have become the enemy's eternal property destined for an eternity in the lake of fire, how would it be possible for them to be reconciled with Jesus if they never believed in Jesus as being the Son of God? 
How would that be possible in light of our Heavenly Father's intent to do so, which is clearly stated in this passage? The Bible tells us that man is appointed once to die, and this is then followed by judgment. And, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So from humanity's perspective, our lives will be judged based on whether we believed in Jesus or not while we were alive on the earth. And judgment on where a person will spend eternity will be executed at Jesus' second coming, where those who are part of the first resurrection will be judged. The Bible, however, also tells us that Jesus paid the price for the sins of the whole world, and not only for those who would believe in him. And we read about this in 1 John chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. These aspects do not include the interaction that may still occur between our Heavenly Father and our enemy, Satan which may have nothing to do with humanity at all, and which could be based on legal grounds alone. If our Heavenly Father intentionally allowed the thief to break into his house before the appointed time, knowing that he would do so, what would be God's purpose for allowing this to happen? I believe he allows it because he loves us so much. Jesus also promised that nobody would pluck any from his hand of those that the Father gave him. And we know that the harvest model shows us that the Father gave the entirety of the second portion of the harvest to Jesus as his possession. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. This is once again a very important passage to consider, because here Jesus promises those who belong to the second portion of the harvest, or the owner's portion, that he will not allow any who are part of this portion to be plucked from his hand. And yet this is what our enemy is currently doing, rushing in to steal as much of God's property as possible, shortly before the time for him to begin the gleaning process arrives. At the time of making this video, the number of genetic modifications through iron being mixed with clay that had occurred in the world already exceeded 800 million people. This is a large number and one then has to ask why would Jesus allow so many people to be stolen by the enemy? And why does he not step in to keep his promise and not to allow any to be plucked from his hand? I am of the opinion that even though this might look like a broken promise to many, this act by our Heavenly Father to allow the enemy to break into his house, is to show the many who have been stolen by our enemy, our Heavenly Father's eternal love for them, even when it would seem that there is no hope remaining. Remember that before Paul revealed the mystery of salvation through faith in the Son of God to the world, countless people perished without the opportunity to receive salvation, because this was hidden for 4,000 years. The enemy may have been under the impression that our Heavenly Father was very kind to him to simply allow people that were made in his image to become the property of the enemy, especially when salvation knowledge had been withheld from them. Even people who intentionally reject our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today do so because of our enemy's deception. If they truly knew who our enemy was and what our Heavenly Father prepared for his children, they would not give Satan a second of their time. However, through lies and deception, our enemy has prevented countless people from coming to the knowledge of the love of our Heavenly Father, which resulted in them entering eternity without hope and without being redeemed. They have become our enemy's property through the choices they made, even though those choices were made while they were deceived. So what is our Heavenly Father's plan by allowing our enemy to break into his house and to steal so many people from his faith harvest? I believe he is allowing our enemy to do this so that a legal case can be brought against him. And the penalty for what Satan is currently busy with is found in Proverbs 6 verse 31. 
Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold, he shall give all the substance of his house. If this passage applies to Satan's transgression of God's law with respect to the harvest, and if he is found to be a thief having stolen that which belongs to Jesus, and I believe the word of God confirms it in more than one place for us, he will be expected to restore to Jesus sevenfold and to give all the substance of his house. Do you understand what that could mean? That could mean that our enemy, Satan, may have to give back every soul that ended up in hell. Not because those people deserve to escape hell, but simply because of a legal matter between God and Satan. This may even include those who are now being deceived by our enemy to take his mark before the appointed time for him to do so has arrived. This would have nothing to do with the relationship that people had with God, but comes down to a legal matter between God and Satan. Imagine what those who lived their lives in service of Satan, and who have now experienced and endured a degree of what awaits Satan and his angels would do, if they discovered that Satan has to give them back to Jesus, because Satan made a crucial mistake by transgressing God's harvest law. Would they not be even more thankful than many Christians today, whose sole purpose in life would seem to be to criticize, judge and condemn others? Can you see how Colossians 1 verse 20 would seem to become a possibility as a result of Satan's failure to keep God's word in mind when he entered God's faith harvest before the time, and that his greed and hatred for God and those created in his image may result in Satan and his angels ending up alone in the lake of fire. However, Colossians 1 verse 20 would also apply to Satan and the fallen angels at some point in time but I have absolutely no idea of how and in which coming age this could possibly happen. For all of humanity, however, would this not be an amazing display of our Heavenly Father's love for humanity, waiting for our enemy to overplay his hand and to end up with a situation in which our Heavenly Father could legally take back all that was given to Satan? Does this not also give us a proper understanding of the following passage, in which our Heavenly Father made this amazing promise to us, which would seem to have been a bittersweet statement before this revelation came to light. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Such an understanding would also give a lot of meaning to the reason behind the bridegroom tarrying, and why God's people had to wait for such a long and painful time before the glorious day would arrive on which we would meet him in the air. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. In both these passages we see how our Heavenly Father intends to wait, and that His purpose for waiting is to save the precious fruit of the earth, and that this is part of His plan to take back what the enemy took from Him by simply telling Satan, It is written. In Isaiah 25 we would seem to have a description of a feast, that our Heavenly Father will prepare when He destroys the enemy's veil of deception, and where He will swallow up death in victory, that will not be a partial victory, but one in which the second death may not even have victory over a single person who was created by God. Also notice how this passage mentions the presence of all people when this feast is held. All of this coming about because Satan may be required to give back all the substance of his house, because he broke God's harvest law, and never paid much attention to the instructions that are clearly given in the word. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. 
And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Remember that I am simply sharing with you what the Lord showed me, and I am probably only scratching the surface of where this could lead. Does this mean that people can now simply live as they want to, without consequences because of what could possibly happen in this matter between our Heavenly Father and Satan? That is certainly not the way to live, and we are clearly instructed to fear God and to have a relationship with Him, through which we can be known by Him. For those who may possibly be saved from eternal damnation as a result of a legal matter between our Heavenly Father and Satan, having nothing to do with people's individual judgments, the following passage may apply to them. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. People who may be saved as part of this legal case against the enemy will almost certainly not be part of the faith harvest because the faith harvest will already be complete by the time that this matter would be judged. Those who may possibly escape our enemy's prison will probably be dressed in clothes that will smell of smoke and will have no rewards in heaven. And that is certainly not how I would want to live for eternity. It is so important to ensure that you are right with God and that you are part of the faith harvest who will rule and reign with him on the new earth and to discover deeper levels of his love for us in the ages to come. As such, if you find yourself in the tribulation, and if you have not received our enemy's mark in your body yet, make sure that you lay down your life to obtain the reward that our Heavenly Father will give to all those who remain devoted to him. Remember what is said of those who die in Christ during the tribulation. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Well, I hope that my explanation was such that it conveyed the message clearly and accurately. As I have said in the beginning, if you do not understand the harvest and temple models, this information may be difficult to grasp, so please watch the series provided below. We are about to meet our Redeemer in the air, any day now, and I am specifically looking towards June 10th as the next High Watch day on my calendar. How awesome it will be to be rid of this world, all the lies, the deceit and the sorrow that we have to deal with daily. I am so ready to leave this place behind, and I hope that you will accompany me when the time comes. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless. Thank you.